a proud immigrant, a proud new American. Uh, in fact, I took the oath of allegiance on October the 18th, 2016, which was in my home state of Maryland, the last day to register to vote in the 2016 presidential election, which I duly did. As I remain a UK citizen, I was also able to vote in the EU referendum. So it's not my fault. <laughs> Except that it sort of is, which is what I'm going to get onto. We've heard a lot about the problems facing liberal societies. I've come to believe that the deepest problem we face is not a lack of economic growth, but a lack of respect. And that respect is, in fact, the essential ingredient of successful liberal democracies. This was a point made by writers and thinkers such as Adam Smith, William Penn, but perhaps the greatest advocate of all for the importance of this value was the late, great Aretha Franklin. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, indeed. And in, in a society of equal respect, we can, to quote Philip Pettit, speak our minds, walk tall among our fellows, and look each other squarely in the eye. Look each other squarely in the eye. I think that captures a really essential truth about respect. In the equal gaze is equal respect. Think about the treatment of African Americans to painfully illustrate the point. For most of US history, a black American who dared look a white American squarely in the eye could be beaten or worse for their insolence, the insolence lying in the presumption of equality that lay in the equal gaze. Today, there are many places in the world where women are not expected to meet equally the gaze of a man for the same reason, that it would indicate a fundamental equality between them. Well, I'm not going to be arguing for some restoration of respect. It's respectability has been sexist and racist. But I am going to argue that closing the resource gap requires us to close the respect gap too. And that's why I find the politics of people like Mr. Bannon so poisonous. Not only because it widens the respect gap, but because it specifically sets out to do so. And to demonize and disrespect people whose only failing is to depart from a nativist, racist ideal. And for me, the most revealing moment of the interview this morning was the reification of the 19th century in the US, an inadvertent, a window into the kind of ideal that he had in mind. Negative populism is fueled not only by anger at the elites, and we deserve some of that, but by disrespect for others. It doesn't let the elites off the hook, however. The elite have paid too little respect to our fellow citizens. We've done so in our thought, in our words, and in our deeds. Firstly, in our thought, by elevating and embracing, as an ideology, meritocracy. We have forgotten, if we ever knew, that the term meritocracy was coined by Michael Young 60 years ago to describe not a utopia, but a dystopia. We're so used to seeing the idea of meritocracy as a good thing, which it sometimes can be, of course, that we've forgotten the fundamental flaws that Young identified. Michael Young, by the way, worried that his word meritocracy wouldn't be taken seriously because it jams together one word with a Greek root and one word with a Latin root. This is the kind of thing British academics worried about <laughs> in the middle of the 20th century. The problem wasn't that the word wasn't taken seriously. The problem was the word was taken very seriously indeed in precisely the opposite way that Young intended. Meritocracy fuels inequality, because in a meritocracy, the winners feel entitled to our winnings. After all, we came by them meritoriously, did we not? It's the philosophical equivalent of because I'm worth it. In a meritocracy, the winners will tend to look down on the losers, seeing not a broken labor market or a broken ladder of opportunity, but broken people making bad choices for which they are responsible. In a meritocracy, 
The danger is that the winners not only see themselves as better off, but that we see ourselves as better. And so the economic gap becomes an empathy gap, which becomes a respect gap. But also in our words, Hillary Clinton describing some of Donald Trump's supporters as deplorables. Never mind they were taken out of context before being bounced around every social media chamber. Barack Obama talking about people who are clinging to their guns and religion. And then today, the shorthand clingers appears on an almost daily basis on Fox News to remind people of that 10 years on. These are famous examples taken out of context, but they speak to a sense that people have that the professional elite are looking down on them, looking down their noses at them. And in doing so, if you're looking down, you are not holding them in an equal gaze. And so much of what lies behind negative populism is dangerous and wrong, and we should call it out fearlessly. But some of it rests upon a legitimate grievance, and we should concede as much and do so respectfully. Thought, word, but also deed, or in some cases, lack of deeds, and our careless approach to policy. We've made the argument for free trade and immigration and automation on the grounds that on net and in the long run, they're good for the economy. And of course they are. But that means that right now, some people are being threatened by them. And yet the policies that would help them most rarely make it to the top of the political agenda. Bill Clinton was wrong not to do more to help workers in terms of wages, training and income support, even as he embraced free trade and sound money. Tony Blair was wrong not to do more, to manage migration and the impacts of migration from the, within the EU. And I agreed with them both strongly at the time, but I was wrong, and they were wrong, and we need to admit as much. Just to make this carelessness concrete in the US context, until the recent tax bill, for every dollar the federal government spends on trade adjustment assistance to help workers, it spends $25 on tax subsidies to the endowments of elite colleges, 25 times as much as on trade adjustment assistance. So yeah, we have some self-examination to do. This disrespect, which I believe the elite has been paying for too long, is now being repaid with interest. The anger channeled through Donald Trump against the so-called experts in the UK, Michael Gove, one of the wonkiest and brainiest politicians of his generation, won applause for saying that people in this country have had enough of experts. Dangerous moments, but as I have said, and I think as David Miliband said, we have to recognize some of the legitimacy in amongst the poison. So what do we do with this respect gap? I think there's plenty we can do. We can start by dethroning the false idol of meritocracy, which serves us winners so well, we can watch our words and our tone when we are talking to our fellow citizens and try and listen as well as speak. And we can aggressively pursue policies, as outlined in the essay that was referred to earlier, that will help, not us, indeed will ask of us some sacrifice, but will help those who need it most. And we can start where the great philosopher Jerry Cohen said social justice was truly to be found, which is in the thick of daily life. And we can make a start by looking each other squarely in the eye. Thank you.